Hello, hello. Um, just wanted to get everyone's attention real quick. That's right. Thank you, Terry. Um, so just wanted to make a quick announcement. Stern Private Equity Club is holding their annual conference next Friday on the 27th. Um, it's a really good opportunity to, to network with some really senior level folks in the industry. Um, just to give you an idea of some of our keynote speakers, we have Joseph Landy who's coming. He's the uh, he's a managing director and founder of a firm called Wormberg Pincus, um, $35 billion private equity fund. We've got, thank you, Ian Sigalo, who is the founder of Graycroft, really big VC fund, invent, uh, invested in companies like Venmo, uh, Trunk Club, and The Skim. Um, we've also got different panels. You want to talk about the panels? Yeah, uh, we've, we're going to have panels on technology, on emerging markets, on LBOs. Uh, we have one on energy and healthcare. So quite a few panels, quite a few interesting discussions. Uh, the panelists are going to be from firms like Blackstone, from 3i, from Apex Partners. So it's, it's going to be a great opportunity to hear from uh, some of the leading private equity practitioners out there. So yeah, it's next Friday. It's going to be at Kimmel Center. Uh, and if you want to register for the conference, you can do it on campus groups on the uh, spec page. Uh, for the Stern Private Equity Club. I think it's like 50 bucks a ticket. If you're still looking for a job in PE, it's not a bad way to network, so probably worth the investment. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Since uh, we were just talking about private equity, Good time to plug for uh, those couple of things I sent you to read on activist investing because it cuts to the heart of what private equity investors do and what they don't. Most of them don't do what they tell you they will do or claim to do. So 90% of, of activist investing is nothing of the sort. It's just guys trying to make a quick buck using this as a vehicle for making a quick buck. So read The Economist, it's a, it's a good article talking about activist investing and the role it plays. Because there is a very strong bias that people have against activist investors. Don't ask me what the basis for it is. Maybe it's the personalities, the people involved. I mean, let me put it this way. I would not want to go to lunch with Carl Icahn. I'd be afraid he'd eat, he'd eat me. I mean, it's a, it's a, it, these are not guys you want to hang out. These are not nice people. I know it's generalizing, but you can't be a nice, polite person and an activist investor at the same time. Think of what. What do activist investors do? Get in manager's face and say, hey, you guys don't know what you're doing. Nice people don't do that. So let's first dispense with the notion that only nice people should be allowed to invest. Second, I think that when you look at activist investors and what they try to do, it's, I mean, I'm not under any illusions here that Carl Icahn lies awake at night wondering what I, what's good for me. 
He's asking what's good for him, not good for me. These people do what they do because they want to make money. But you know why I want them to do that? Because I want to piggyback on what they do and hope to make some money too. So we have to clear out the illusions about activist investing. They're, they're people who are people you probably don't want to hang out with, but if you take them out of the market, if you have a market full of polite, nice people, incumbent managers are going to stay incumbent managers forever. Okay? So today we're going to actually jump into risk and return. I laid the foundations, right? Danger plus opportunity. And I said, the essence of every risk and return model in finance is to measure the danger in an investment and look at how much opportunity you need to compensate for the danger. So let me lay out some of the things I would like to see in a good risk and return model. So let's set this on the table before we look at the choices. Here are the five things I'd like a risk and return model to do for me. Okay? So in an idealistic world or an ideal world, here's what a good risk and return model should do. It should come up with a measure of risk that works across any kind of asset. So if I give you stocks, small stocks, large stocks, U.S. stocks, emerging market stocks, bonds, real estate, I'd like a measure of risk that cuts across all investments because as an investor, I can choose among all of them. So I want something that works across all investments. Second, I want a risk and return model that tells me what types of risk I will get rewarded for and what types of risk I will not get rewarded for. You're saying, why shouldn't I get rewarded for all kinds of risk? I'll give you an absolutely absurd example to bring this home. Let's assume you live across a six-lane highway. Make it a freeway. Very busy. Four or five in a... In a and every day what you do is you get up in the morning, you run across all six lanes to get to the brokerage house on the other side. Very risky, right? So the end of the year you say, look, I'm taking a lot of risk every day. How come my returns are not higher? The problem is you took the wrong kind of risk. It's an absurd example, but I want to bring home the point that just because you take risk doesn't mean you're entitled to a reward. I want a risk and return model to tell me whether running across a freeway is a good type of risk or a bad type of risk and whether I'll get rewarded for that. Third, I'd like to come up with a, a risk and return model that gives me a number for a company. And I don't need to be able to, I don't have to compare that number across companies to get a sense of whether this is a risky company or a safe company. You say, what are you talking about? Let me give you an example. Let's assume that I use standard deviation as my measure of risk. In finance classes, we talk about this all the time. And I told you that the standard deviation for IBM was 36%. Then I said, is that ri high risk, average risk, or low risk? Unless you're some kind of junkie or financial junkie who just watches this stuff all the time, you don't know whether 36% is high, average, or low. It's a number that by itself doesn't tell you much. So I'd like a risk measure that if I look at it, all I have to do is look at it. And I can say, is this, this is high, this is average, this is low. Fourth, I want a risk and return model that will convert that risk measure into an expected return. Don't forget the end game here. What are, we, what are we looking for? Hurdle rates, right? We need to be able to convert the risk measure into an expected return. And finally, and this is a very unpleasant requirement, it has to work. It's too bad that we have that because there are lots of risk and return models I can come up with that are great looking models that might not work. So what I'd like to start with is the base model that we're all taught in finance classes. And we've been taught this for 50 years. This has been the basis for every finance class. It's a capital asset pricing model. You've all seen it in foundations, right? Or you will be seeing it or you're seeing it. Yeah. Now, the way in which I was taught ca the CAPM in foundations is statistically. You, know, you take a two-asset portfolio, you write the equation out, then you start... And then you add a little math, and you do a little calculus, and next thing you know, you've got the CAPM. About 25 years ago, somebody asked me, can you teach the CAPM without you ever using a number? And I hadn't done it until then, and I said, you know what, I think I can try that. So I'm going to try this out on you, and I've been trying it out for 25 years, so maybe I've got it nailed down, or maybe I haven't. So we're going to walk through the CAPM without <coughs> using a number. Entirely intuitively, let's see if we can get the CAPM. I'm going to list out how the CAPM tries to meet those five requirements. It first defines variance of returns around an actual, around an expected return as a measure of risk. So risk is defined as how different actual returns are from the expected returns. So the, that, we'll come back and revisit each of these steps. Second, it specifies that only that portion of the variance that you cannot diversify away is going to get rewarded. 
say, what are you talking about? There's, there's a big chunk of risk in a company that you could argue gets averaged out in a portfolio, and the CAPM says, you're not going to get rewarded for that. So it must make some assumption that allows it to do that. Third, it measures that non-diversifiable risk with a beta. You know what the nice thing about a beta is? If I tell you the stock is a beta 1.5, what am I telling you about the stock? Above average, below average, or average risk? Above average. What? Beta stand alone. So be all I have to do is give you the beta of a stock. You don't have to compare across betas. The fact is if it's greater than 1, it's riskier than average. It's less than 1, it's safer than average. It converts that beta in an expected return by taking the risk-free rate, and we'll talk a little bit more about what a risk-free rate is, and then multiplying the beta with an equi equity risk premium, which is what you would demand for, a st well, for an investment with a beta 1, an average risk investment. So it's almost there, right? It's met four of the five conditions. It works at least as well as the next best model. I'm damning with faint praise here, right? Because I didn't say it works well. I said it works at least as well as the next best model, and they're all crappy. So I've told you up front. Was, and then I'll come back and defend why we still use this incredibly crappy model still in our coming up with expected returns. So let's start with the first step. CAPM defines risk as variance of actual returns around an expected return. It's called the mean variance framework. It's at the heart of, you know, four people have won Nobel Prizes for it. And essentially, it's at the heart of finance. But it's kind of abstract. You say, what are you talking about? Let me give you three or four investments to kind of bring home this point. Let's assume that you're an investor with a one-year time horizon. And you buy a one-year T-bill. And let's, for the moment, assume that the U.S. Treasury <coughs> is default-free. It's an assumption, right? There's no, there's no fit. So let's assume it's default free. What's a one-year table trading at right now? Do you know? Maybe 0.2%, 0.15, 0 0.2%. So let's suppose you buy the one-year table. You're promised to return a 0.2%. You have a one-year time horizon. A year from now, I come and knock on your door and say, what did you make on that one-year table? What's your answer going to be? There's no default risk. You're going to make exactly what you were promised up front. You're always going to make the 0.2%. That is a riskless investment. Your actual return is always equal to your expected return. Now let me come one step up the risk ladder. Let's say you buy a 10-year T-bond. Right now the interest rate in a 10-year T-bond is about 2.1 percent. Let's say that's a coupon rate. You buy the T-bond at the auction today. One year from now I come and knock on your door and say, what did you make on that T-bond? What portion of the return is guaranteed? You'd get the coupon. That's guaranteed, the 2.1 percent. What portion is not? The price at the end of the year, because you've got nine years left on this bond, and if interest rates change, the price of the bond will change. This is actually the first thing I want to bring home about risk-free rates when you come back to it. A 10-year T-bond is not risk-free if you have a one-year time horizon. So a 10-year T-bond is riskier than a one-year T-bill with a one-year time horizon. Let's keep climbing the ladder. Let's assume you buy stock in Con Ed. Regulated utility. Boring company, right? You walk in with open eyes. You say, it's a safe company. I expect to make a 7% return. You're not being unrealistic. A year from now, I come and knock on your door. Is your actual return also going to be 7%? So if you're lucky, it might be 9, 11, 12. It's not going to be 400%. If you're unlucky, it might be 1, 3, or even minus 4, but it's not going to be minus 50%. It's an investment with more risk, but because it's a regulated, mature company, this risk. It's the one final step up the ladder. Tesla had a bad week last week. He said, this is the time for me to get into Tesla. Buy it at $204 per share. It's a risky company. He said, I expect to make a 15% return. A year from now, I come and knock on your door. If you were lucky, what might have happened? what happened a couple of years ago when it went up at 400%. So if you're lucky, it could be, in fact, you listen to Elon Musk, he thinks it could be Apple. All it needs is revenues of 345 billion, margins like BMW, <laughs> and a price earnings ratio of like a tech company. <laughs> in analogies, of my, my grandmother had a mustache, was German, and had been born uh, 30 years later, she could have been Hitler. I mean, it's, it's kind of absurd, <laughs> you know? All kinds of, you could make up all kinds of stuff. So I don't know whether Elon Musk was drunk or whether he had a moment of weakness. But let's say you listen and say, you know what? 
Tesla could be Apple. That's your upside. It could, what, what, could, what could go wrong? Well, it's, lots of things can go wrong, right? The BMW electric car, Apple could announce next tomorrow that they're going to come out with an electric car. The stock could go to 25 or 20 or 15. So if you're lucky, you could make 400%. If you're not, you could lose 80%. Much riskier investment. T-Bull, T-Bond, Con Ed, Tesla. In every one of those scenarios, though, when I talked about risk, notice I was talking about risk over the next year. There is no risk in the past. You know why? It's already happened. But here's one of the great inconsistencies in finance. If I ask you how risky is Tesla, or how risky is Con Ed, or how risky is a 10-year bond in terms of price change? What are we trained to do after finance class? Go backwards. Take the last two years. Look at the standard deviation. All our numbers come from the past, but all our risk is in the future. We're going to come back and face up to this because it's going to be one of those issues we have to deal with. It. We can't get data from the future. Okay? So we have to look at the past, but we have to deal with that inconsistency that risk is always forward-looking. So when we talk about the mean variance framework, we're saying we want a higher expected return, that's the good stuff, that's the opportunity, but the risk is going to come with higher variance around that expected return. Now, in the mean variance framework, we generally, as I said, look backwards, we measure variance, so for if, I, if you ask me how risky is Disney, I go back and I look at the last two years, the last five years, and you know, you can cal calculate the standard deviation. If you have an Excel spreadsheet, you know, you don't even need to compute the standard deviation, use the standard deviation function with enough data, you can get a standard deviation for any company over any period. And I, I can compute the standard deviation and I can give you all kinds of neat numbers about the past. But if you use them as your risk for the future, you are making a leap of faith, right? What's a leap of faith? The company isn't changing, the market isn't changing. You say, what choice do I have? We'll come back and deal with that, but that's, I think, at the essence, it's the essence of the problem you face in measuring risk. All the data is in the past, all your risk is in the future. But before we dig deeper, I want to take a pause, because in the mean variance framework, there are only two things you worry about. What's the expected return, what's the variance, and that's it. So if I offer you two investments which have the same standard deviation, same variance, and one has a higher expected return, and I ask you, which one would you pick? It's a no-brainer. You'd go with the one with the higher expected returns. But I want to raise a fundamental question. Is that how investors behave? And to do this, I'm going to offer you two investments which have the same expected return, 15%, and the same standard deviations. In the mean variance world, you'd be indifferent between these two investments because they look exactly alike. But I'm going to throw in a tweak that makes them a little different. In one of these investments, there's a very small possibility that you could quadruple your money. It's already embedded in the expected return, so it's not like you're getting an extra. It's already in the expected return, so already in the standard deviation. But the best possible payoff you can get on the second investment, investment B, is 50%. In a mean variance framework, you're going to say, I don't care. The fact that you can quadruple is already in my standard. But here's what I'd like you to tell me as an investor. Do you think this might alter your decisions? I'll give you the choices. How many of you would still be indifferent between A and B? Because of the same expected return and standard. There's no right or wrong answer, so don't worry about what everybody else is picking. This is a function. It's a function of utility, how you derive utility, how you think about risk. So nobody, so nobody in this room lives in a mean variance framework. Remember that, because a cap M comes out of the mean variance framework. So it must come out of a world different from the one that we all live in. But that's the first thing to remember. The mean variance framework is an article of faith, but it's based on an assumption. Now let me ask you the following question. How many would prefer investment A because it has that very small chance of quadrupling? And you see this every day, right? You're in a hurry, you're at the 7-Eleven, there are three people in front of you, and what are they doing? Picking numbers. Give me 53, 30. You say, please. Can I pick the numbers for you? I'll do the randomizer for you. But they have some weird... But they're buying lottery tickets, right? What's the expected return on a lottery ticket? It's, I wish it was zero. Because in most states, a portion of the money is supposed to go for education, so it's minus 30, minus 40, minus 
you're okay with it. Why? Because there is this very, very real, small, it's your only chance to become a millionaire. So don't look down in now, no, at, uh, you know, don't look down your nose at these people. This is their only chance of making it. So that's what I remind myself before I feel like slapping them around, saying, get out of the way, I need to get my stuff, you can then pick numbers. People like the possibility of high payoffs. You think those people are not in the stock market. Think about investing in these young tech companies. You might walk in with open eyes saying, I know the risk return odds are not in my favor when I invest in a Twitter, a Facebook, a LinkedIn, or a Yelp. But you know why you still might invest in them even though the risk return trade-off is not in your favor? Because the chance that you could quadruple your money is there. Whereas if you invest in a Coca-Cola or a Procter & Gamble, the risk return trade-off might be in your favor, but you're never going to make 400%. In statistics, we call this skewness. We love to throw these buzzwords around. Preference for skewness. Basically, it's that preference for big positive payoffs that then drives you towards investing in investments which might look not that attractive on an expected return variance straight off, but because you want the payoff. Let me throw another factor into the mix. Let's take out the first one. And what if, uh, what if you were told that there is a small possibility now that you could lose 100% of your money on investment A, but that the most you can lose is only 50% in investment B. Would, do you think that might alter your decision? How many of you would now pick B over A because I've kind of put a floor on your losses. In statistics, this is called kurtosis, the kind of jumps that you get. And as investors, when you get big jumps and it pushes you in the wrong direction, you might say, you know what? I don't like that. It's like, it's like just like you dislike risk. You also dislike these big risks that can wipe you out. So the world is a lot more complicated than the mean variance framework would have us believe. Investors don't just look at the expected return variance. They look at the possibility of payoff. They look at the worst case scenarios. And all those things feed into the investment. And you're not the one who's being irrational. It's the people who assume that you don't care about that stuff who are being unrealistic. So economists say, why don't you guys behave like our models want you to behave? That's not your responsibility. You have to behave in a way that makes you okay with your investment. And when you make investment choices, you factor in other factors. So the first step in these models is already a little shaky, right? We're going to build more shaky stuff on top, so get ready. So that's the first step is the mean variance framework. Expected return variance, we don't work. So let's go back to the mean variance. We'll act like all we care about is expected return and standard deviation. Second stop in the model. Not all risk is created equal. So what are you talking about? Let's take an investment in a company. I'll take the company that I'm looking at. Let's, take, let's say you invest in Disney. Let's think about all the possible things that can affect Disney stock price. I don't know what the next Disney movie is, but Frozen Alone was this huge hit, right? Lone Ranger was a huge disaster. Now let's, just, I don't know what the next movie is, yeah? but let's uh, look at the next Disney movie. It's a project, it's an investment. It could, do like, it could be like Frozen, make you a ton of money. It could be the Lone Ranger, lose you a lot of money. There's risk in the next movie that Disney makes. Disney spent a billion dollars on California Adventure. You know California Adventure is right across the, 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 whatever that middle section is from Disney, the, from Magic Kingdom in Disneyland. They spent a billion dollars putting in a cars ride and all that stuff. Would it pay off? Maybe it will, maybe it won't. That's an investment that Disney has made that could do better than expected, worse than expected. Those are investments that affect just Disney. So if Disney screws up on the next movie, it's not like the S&P 500 is going to collapse and oil prices are going to go up. I don't think so. Disney doesn't have that much influence, but, but it's just there. Let's move one step up the ladder. Disney is in the broadcasting business. In fact, it's big. It's the, the jewel in the crown is ESPN, right? And you can see that everybody else is looking at ESPN and saying, why don't we do it too? So Fox Sports and CBS Sports all have their little channels going. Right now ESPN is the king of the hill, but who knows what the future will bring. Maybe Fox Sports will sign up Kim Kardashian to do sports. Reality sports shows. Watch her do crazy things while she's talking about sports. Who knows? People do strange things, they watch it and next thing you know ESPN's audience leaves. So 
when you think about that risk, it affects Disney, it affects Fox, it affects CBS, maybe the players. So now we've gone from risk that affects one company to risk that affects maybe five or six companies. Now let's think about Disney and the cable. It's, it's part of that, that, that network broadcasting business. Let's say that the FCC comes out with this new rule. P nobody quite knows what the effect of net neutrality will be. Let's assume that comes out. It's going to affect Disney. It's going to affect Comcast. So there's a whole set of companies in that space, maybe 30 or 40 or 50 companies that are going to be affected because of a shift in the law, because of a shift in the rules, because of a shift in the sector. So we've gone from risk that affects one company to five companies to maybe 50 companies. Hang in there with me because you think, where are we going? You're going to see in a moment why this matters. The dollar's gone through a pretty strong period, right? Last six months or a year, the dollar's up against about 10% against the euro, against about 12% against the Japanese yen. Does it affect Disney? Do you have a stronger dollar? Yeah, sure, it affects them in, in, in good ways and bad ways, more bad ways than good ways because there are fewer tourists coming into Disney theme parks because effectively you've raised the price of a Disney theme park ticket by 10 or 15%. So Disney is affected, but probably 1,000, 1,200 companies are affected, some in good ways, some in bad ways. So when we talk about risk like exchange rate risk, we're talking about risk that now cuts across hundreds, perhaps even thousands of companies. Let's take one final example. Every three months, Janet Yellen shows up in front of Congress, right? I pity the woman. I pity any person who's a Federal Reserve Chair. Because every time you open your mouth, things happen, right? I mean, notice, if you're a Fed chair, you start speaking slower and slower and slower the longer you're a Fed chair, because every word you've got to, if I say that, will the market drop 10%? Because there are these people freaking out. They're, they're, they've hired psychologists to watch you while you're speaking. She paused before she said interest rates. That's a bad sign. Sell bonds now. Right. So it's the next Federal Reserve report to Congress. And Janet Yellen gets up there and says, we think the economy is getting too strong. Moment of weakness. You know what's going to happen in the next second, right? The Fed thinks the economy is getting too strong. People say, well, that means they're going to try to raise interest rates. And the next thing you know, the bond market is selling off. The, the market will be down five. And it's not just Disney that's going to be affected. It's every stock, not just in the U.S. market, but probably globally, you're going to create these ripple effects. So I've gone from risk like frozen risk, which is affecting one company, to Janet Yellen risk that affects pretty much every company. You say, who cares? If you put all your money in Disney, what risk are you exposed to? Come on, don't think too long. You're exposed to everything. You worry about, will the next movie make it? But if you start spreading your investments across 20 or 25 or 30 companies, magic happens. And here's the magic. What's the essence of risk that affects one company? Sometimes it can be good news and sometimes it can be bad news, right? I actually have 50, about 50 companies in my portfolio. Every day when I walk, you know, read the Wall Street Journal, it's like going on a roller coaster ride. So on the second page, there's good news on one of my companies. This is good. Petrobras hasn't gone under yet. <laughs> then I get to page seven and they say, well, you know, some, you know, there's been evidence that, you know, a fraud at Disney. Oh, my God. So by the time I finish the paper, there's good news on four companies, bad news on four companies, even if it's not in the same day, across time, things average out. It looks like magic. But it's actually a very simple statistical theorem, right? It's a law of large numbers. If you have 30 or 35 companies, and you're talking about things that affect one company at a time, they're going to cut across the companies. Some is going to be good news, some is going to be bad news. It's going to average out. It's as simple as that. That's why diversification reduces risk. It's not because of some elaborate financial theorem. It's a law of large numbers. But it works only on risk that is company specific. So the risk that affected one or a few companies gets averaged out in my portfolio. So it's not even the simplistic argument of if I have one out of 30 stocks and bad things happen, it doesn't affect my portfolio. It's a much stronger one, which is for every company where something bad happens, there'll be another company where something good happens. And things will average out across my portfolio if the risk is firm specific. So let's say you buy the S&P 500. You've got a pretty diversified portfolio, right? Things that 
companies do individually in the S&P 500 are going to get averaged out. But if Janet Yellen lets out a bomb about interest rates, guess what? It doesn't matter whether you got the S&P 500, the NYC composite, or every stock in the world, you are going to feel the effect that day when you look at your portfolio. Market risk cannot be diversified away. You can avoid it. You can say, I'm going to put all my money in T-bills. That's fine. But if you put your money in risky assets, the risk that affects most or all companies cannot be diversified away. So basically, diversification reduces risk. It reduces risk because you average out across your investments. And here's where the CAPM makes its second big assumption. I told you I had how many stocks in my portfolio? 50, right? Now, the, the, it's actually easy to show that adding an extra stock always reduces that firm specific risk. So when I go from 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4. But why did I stop at just 50? I mean, now there are 41,000 plus publicly traded stocks around the world. And then there are bonds and real. I mean, I stopped at just 50. Give me the cruel answer first. I don't have enough money. Okay, you're right. But Fidelity Magellan is 150 billion, and they have only about 180 stocks in their portfolio. So what's their excuse for stopping? You see the question I'm asking is diversification is good. Why do we stop diversifying? There's actually two reasons. Let's see if you can come up with the two reasons. What are the two reasons people stop continuing to add to their portfolios? Diminishing marginal, the benefit of that 51st stock as opposed to the second is smaller, but it's still positive. The 5,001st stock will still create a benefit. So what's the other half of the equation that you've got to weigh it against? There is some cost, right? There's a transaction cost, and not just the $8.95 you pay on E-Trade, but the bid-ask spread, etc. So there's a trend. So the first reason we stop is it's not free to keep adding stocks. There's a transaction cost. What's the other? Somebody want to try? No? Yes? You think you can pick the right stocks. Let's be clear. Nobody, and in fact, I'm not picking on you, but none of us wants to be average investors. Can you imagine going to a cocktail party and saying, I'm an average investor, come listen to me. You get no traction out of that. So we all want to beat the market. We all want to be above average. In fact, my school district last year released this uh, finding that 99% of the students in our district are above average. Which leads me to believe that this is really incredible, stu kid, incredibly stupid kid in the district with a negative IQ, <laughs> a GPA of minus 17. He's sold short on GPA. He's actually gone beyond, below zero. And he's pulling the average down. But you know why the school district does it, right? You tell a parent, your kid is above average. No parent complains. No, 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 no. My kid is not above average. He's average. We all want to beat the market, and we think we can pick stocks. There are two reasons we stop diversifying. One is transactions costs. The other is we think we can pick stocks. Whether it's true or not, we think we can. You know what the CAPM assumes? It assumes first that the investor setting prices are diversified. We, we're going to call these the marginal investors. Mar and I'll come back and define what you need. To, the marginal investor is the one who sets the price. You and I are not marginal investors because... I buy a thousand shares of Apple, I'm not changing the price. Okay. So we'll come back and talk about the, that marginal investment, why the CAPM is so focused on it. But it also assumes that that marginal investor faces no transactions costs and has no private information, which is a euphemism for can't pick stocks. So file that away because if I take away transactions costs and I take away your capacity to pick stocks, you know when you should stop diversifying? Never. You think that's absurd. It's absurd because you're thinking about the world you live in now. But think about a cap M world. No transactions cost, you can't pick stock. You just put everything in, you know, you invest in every traded asset, not just every stock, but every bond, every real asset, every piece of asset that's traded. But let me take a pause on this notion of a marginal investor because it's critical to understanding the cap M. You know the typical investor in the U.S., how many shares or how many you know, different companies he or she owns in his portfolio or her portfolio? Wish it were five. It's three. The median number of holdings for an investor who invests actively, thank God only about 30 or 40 percent try to do this. The rest is put their money in mutual funds. 
is three stocks. So if that were the investor setting prices, he or she is clearly not diversified. So here's why understanding who the margin investor is critical. If you think of the investor as the typical investor who owns three stocks, then the entire model falls apart. The marginal investor, though, has to be able to affect prices. And to be able to affect prices, you need to own or trade a lot of shares. So if you own 100 shares and he owns a million shares, 100 shares, I don't, really, I don't care what you think about risk. I'm not trying to, yeah, but a million shares I do. You both own a million shares. You're a founder who can never trade and he can trade. He's going to affect prices more than you can. So the marginal investor owns a lot of shares and trades those shares. So if you're, the marginal investor in your company is diversified, then it doesn't matter that the rest of the world is not because that marginal investor is the one who sets prices. You see how I've lowered the ante on? Because if I require every investor to be diversified, the model is never going to work. Because you're always going to get that holdout saying, I'm going to put all my money in one stock. I can't make that guy or person kind of come back to reality. All I need is the marginal investor to be diversified. And if that happens, then the rest of the model goes through. Every single risk and return model in finance is built on that presumption that the marginal investor is diversified. You think, is that realistic? I can't answer that question unless you tell me for which company. And here's a very simple way to think about the marginal investor. If most of your shares in your company, 60, 70, 80% of the shares in your company, are held by institutional investors, your marginal investor is probably going to be an institution. In the US, about 70% of all shares across companies are held by institutions. What kind of institutions? Mutual funds, pension funds, private equity funds. 70% of the money is held by institutions, and if it's a large market cap stock, that could be 80 or 85%. So if I look at your holdings and the 80% of your shares are held by BlackRock, State Street, Fidelity, I think your marginal investor is an institutional investor. I don't know whether you got a chance to see the holdings uh, webcast I put up. I know you didn't, but I'll act like you did. Okay? But one of the companies I used, of course, was Las Vegas Sands. Anybody see, uh, know who the largest stockholder in Las Vegas, I've mentioned this before, it's, uh, who's the largest stockholder in Las Vegas Sands? Sheldon Adelson owns 52% of the shares. That's actually legitimate control. He doesn't play games with the voting shares like Mark Zuckerberg does. He actually owns 52%. So you say, he must be the marginal investor. You know why Sheldon Adelson is not the marginal investor in Las Vegas Sands? He owns a lot of shares, but what does he not do? He doesn't trade those shares. Why not? Because he can't, if he trades, he can give up control. So this is one of the great ironies. For Sheldon Adelson to be rich, you know who he has to keep happy? The institutional investors in Las Vegas Sands. It, it's true that his interests will play a much greater role there, but even if only 30% of your shares are held by institutions, but the rest is held by a founder, CEO, founder, owner, the institutional investor is still going to be the marginal investor. It is true that if you have a relatively low percentage held by institutions and a large percentage held by founders, it could be true that your marginal investor is an individual investor. Now we're entering into the danger zone. The reason being the more like, if your marginal investor is an individual investor, everything we're going to talk about beyond this is going to be much shakier. So when we talk about look at only the risk you cannot diversify away, that's much more dangerous in the, in, in, when, when you have a small individual investor who owns three shares being the one setting your stock price. So your first stop when you look at your company is look at the breakdown of stock holdings and ask the question, am I on safe ground assuming that the marginal investor in my company is an institutional investor? So let me go back to Disney. I want to make this judgment because if I'm going to use beta for Disney, I first have to be clear that it's okay to use beta. So I went back and looked at the top stock orders in Disney. This is the third time you've seen this page, but it's been at three points in time. The first time I showed you the page was 2003, where there were no big individuals on the list. The biggest was Roy Disney with 0.7%. The second was 2009. And who was the biggest stock order then? It was Steve Jobs. This is 2013, and of course, because Steve Jobs passed on, his, his, uh, Lorraine Jobs now has his holding. Oh, but there's somebody else on the list, George Lucas. How the heck did he show up as, because when they bought Lucasfilms, when Disney bought Lucasfilms, they paid in shares. 
Now, neither George Lucas nor Lorene Jobs is a marginal investor because neither trades. So while well, Disney has gone from 2003 to two, the, the holdings have changed. In the case of Disney, I was on safe ground in 2003, assuming the marginal investor was an institution. I was okay in 2009, assuming the marginal investor is an institution. I'm still okay in 2013, making that same judgment. Which means I can use betas, I can use the CAPM, I'm okay, I'm getting a license to do all of that stuff. In fact, if you break down the holdings, you can see that Disney, Vale preferred the common shares and not traded because they're the ones the government uses to enforce control. And Baidu all have about 70%. In those three companies, I think I'm on fairly solid ground assuming that on the next big trade, and this is what I mean by the marginal investor, on the next big trade, it's probably one institution buying and another institution selling. The next million <laughs> share trade. So those three, are, Tata Motors and Deutsche are a little tricky. Deutsche does have a lot of individual investors, right? 59%. And so does, and, and Tata has, has individual investors and it's got these Tata company holdings. <coughs> so these are the actual holdings. So I decided to take a, uh, take a deeper dive into both those companies and look at what percentage of the trading in these companies, not who held the shares, but where the trading came from. And with both Tata Motors and Deutsche, even though individuals might own 50, 60 percent of the company or non-institutions own, about 70 to 80 percent of the trading in these companies is institutional trading. Huge sigh of relief for me at this stage because now what have I said? Now all of these companies, I can assume the margin investment is an institution and I'm going to assume that that institution is diversified. You think, what if that's not the case for my company? Because you've picked individual companies. You might have picked a small Midwestern company where there isn't a single institutional holder. Don't change your company. I will give you the tools to handle that company because I need those tools. You know what? There's one company that I did not show you on this list. I'm doing six companies. You're seeing only five on the list. What's the sixth company I said I was going to track through this process? <coughs> Bookscape, that independent bookstore, right? Who's a marginal investor in a privately owned business? It's the owner, and is the owner of a private business ever likely to be diversified? It's almost impossible to do because you've got all your wealth tied up in the business. So I'm going to, with Bookscape, take what to do about the fact that the marginal investor is not diversified, and in the process, I'll give you a way of coming up, a, a way of getting over this hurdle of what if my marginal investor is not a diversified investor? Yes? Actually, you can look at the percentage of trading. You can look at, uh, you know, you go to Bloomberg, you can check out the trading volume or capital IQ. You can see where the trading comes from. So you can look at, at least, it won't know, it give you the individual names that trade, but it can give you the percentage of trading that comes from institutions and individuals. So as I said, the limiting case here is if I take out the transactions costs and I take out private information, you end up with this portfolio that includes every single traded asset in the world. So what should we call this portfolio? It includes every traded asset in the market. Oh, let's call it the market portfolio. We weren't feeling particularly creative that day, I guess. So the market portfolio, as I said, is like a gigantic index fund with an 800 number. And every one of us, if this were the CAPM world, would invest in that index fund, which is a little odd because risk aversion varies across people. So let me pick on you guys now. Let's assume that you don't want to take any risk. You want to take some risk, and you want to take more risk, and you want to take even more risk, four people. They all live on the same street. You have only two choices in this world. You can either put your money in something riskless, or you can put it in this gigantic index fund of every risky asset. Where would you put your money? You want to take no risk. You'd put it all in the riskless asset and say, I'm done. You put half your money in the riskless asset, half in the market portfolio and say, I'm okay now. You put all your money in the market portfolio and say, I'm feeling good now, but you're not still happy, right? So if you want to take even more risk than what you get by putting 100%, in this world at least, you know how you take more risk? You'd go out and borrow money and you'd buy that same index fund. You see why? Because that's the most efficient way to take risk. Because if you decide to pick the riskiest stocks in the market, it's true, you could get a higher risk portfolio, but it will not deliver as high a return as borrowing money and buying that index fund. So every one of us ends up holding the same gigantic index fund 
or market portfolio as we prefer to call it, which includes every single traded asset in the world held in proportion to its market value. It's actually not that unrealistic anymore. If you go to Vanguard, you actually get a total market index fund. That's a global index fund. It doesn't include every single traded stock. It does a sampling. But we're getting close to the point where you will be able to get to an index fund that includes, which is essentially the market portfolio. So at this stage, we all hold the market portfolio. So now let's think about the risk of an individual asset to you. Remember the world you're in now. Each of us holds only the market portfolio. If we've chosen to take risk, I come to you with a stock. You can name the stock. It could be Tesla, it could be Disney, it could be, you know, whatever. Biogen. Yeah. No, no, wait. What did I say? I didn't say diversification reduces risk. What did I say? It reduces what type of risk? Firm-specific risk. It reduces the useless risk. It doesn't. So I can be diversified and hugely risky at the same time. Because if, I, if the only thing you can do with diversification is actually lower your risk, then what happens to those people who want to take a lot of risk? So diversification doesn't reduce risk. It reduces firm-specific risk. It can't do anything about market risk. Because it's all market risk. Well, then you're not going to get rewarded for 80% of the risk. My market portfolio is all non-diversifiable risk. It's a risk you're going to get rewarded for, and you're not going to get the same expected return. If you put all your money in one stock, that's really risky. Okay. So it's a, it's a very simple proposition if you buy into the assumptions. So the risk now of an individual stock becomes the risk it adds to your portfolio. Because you already have a portfolio. It's silly to think about the risk of a stock standing alone. You say, how much risk will it do? And we measure that risk statistically by how that stock or asset moves with the market portfolio. You see why? If you buy a stock which has nothing to do with the market portfolio, and most of your money is already in the market portfolio, adding that stock actually does nothing to your risk because it moves completely randomly. So statistically, I try to measure how your stock moves with the portfolio. And statistically, you measure that with a correlation and a covariance. They're actually related. That's actually the end of the CAPM. In the CAPM, the risk of a stock is the covariance of that stock with the market portfolio. So the more a stock moves with the market portfolio, the riskier it is. In the initial derivation of the CAPM, they stopped there. And here was the problem with the covariance number. The covariance of Tesla with the market portfolio is 26 percent. You see the problem with that? If I ask you, is that good? Is that bad? Is that hard? You have no way of knowing, right? So here's the last step in the process. I'm going to take the, each covariance that I have and divide it by the same number, the average variance of the whole market. The average variance of the whole market is about 15 percent. So if I take 26 percent, which is the covariance for Tesla, and divide by 15 percent, I end up with about 1.7, which is what we call the beta. Every time you use beta, you're carrying all this baggage with you, whether you like it or not. What type of baggage? You bought in the mean variance framework. You assume the margin investor was diversified. You ended up with the market portfolio. And you measure the risk with this risk added to the market portfolio. It makes complete sense if you buy into those pieces. And once I get that beta for Tesla, 1.7, or whatever it is for your stock, then I can get the expected return as the risk-free rate plus that beta, because it's a measure of relative risk, times what I would make as a return on the market portfolio, which is like an average risk across all, across all equities, all risky investments. That's the premium I would demand. So that's without using an equation, a derivation of the cap -M. So remember those five steps, because they kind of take you to the end game. Now, I, I make a confession. I still use the CAPM when I do valuation, I do corporate finance. It's 50 years old. It's showing its age. In fact, every five or six years, there's a new model that comes out, and people are convinced of the CAPM. This is the end of the CAPM. In fact, I think The Economist alone has run a dozen headline articles saying beta is dead. The CAPM is dead. But the CAPM seems to be like Freddy Krueger. Every Halloween you kill him off and he's back again next year. So I'll take you through three of the critiques I consistently hear every time I do a valuation, whether it's on my blog or whether it's a, to an audience of managers or CFOs. And I'll take them through layers from least 
problematic critiques to the most difficult ones to defend against. The first critique I hear when I talk about the beta is somebody say, the model makes unrealistic assumptions. Does it? Come on, you can say, I, I don't take this personally. You see, what does it assume? No transactions cost, no private information, everybody cares. Of course it does. It doesn't bother me in the least. You know why? Because I used to be an econ major in a previous lifetime. Remember those realistic models in Econ 101? Where if only you could observe the second derivative of the utility function to what everything would be clear? I remember putting up my hand and saying, when will I get to see it? I said, nobody's seen it yet, but once you see it, it'll all be clear. <laughs> I've never seen anybody be able to use a U double prime W in a model and get away with it. So given a choice between realistic models that nobody can use and unrealistic models that I can actually use, I'll go with the latter. So that critique I can live with. The second one will come from the guy in the last row, basic coward. He put up his hand and say, but you could be wrong. About what? Your beta could be wrong. Your risk premium could be wrong. Which my response is, that's all you think I've got wrong? What about my earnings, my cash flows, my growth rate? They're all wrong. You know why they're wrong? Because I'm trying to forecast the future. If your criterion for using a model is you got to guarantee me that every number is right, you will never be able to use a risk and return model. But now comes a critique that cuts to the bone. What did I say the fifth requirement for a good model is it has to work, right? And if you buy into the cap and the only measure of risk you need for a stock is a beta. So beta should explain all of the differences in returns across companies. So if I did a correlation of betas against actual returns over a very long periods, 50 years, the correlation should be close to one if the cap M is right, right? 100% of the variation in returns should be explained by differences in betas. Two professors at the University of Chicago, Gene Farmer and Ken French, said, okay, let's try that out. Let's see what percentage of the re returns we can explain with betas. And I'll tell you what, it's not 100%. It's not 90%, it's not 80%. You know what the actual number is? It's 8%. Think about it. Next, that's actually a nice way of saying we're using a model that doesn't explain 92% of what's going on, right? So at this point, you're saying, what the heck are you doing? Why don't you come up with a better model? So I'm going to try. And people have been trying for 50 years to come up with a better model. You're not the first one. I'm not the first one to discover the CAPM doesn't work. So everybody wants a better model. But for 14 years, the CAPM was the only game in time. From 64 to 78, people said, what else can we do? 1978, a guy called Steve Ross, the, uh, at, uh, he's, he still teaches at Yale, I think, said, we're trying to capture all of, see the market risk is risk that affects most or all companies, right? It can come from interest rates, inflation, GDP, ex I mean, who knows what it comes from. You're trying to capture that all with one beta. He said, that's silly. Why don't we allow for multiple sources of market risk? So he wasn't changing step one and step two. He's still making those same two steps. But he said, instead of trying to capture all of that market risk with one beta, why don't we allow for multiple sources of market risk and have a beta against each one? Sounds better, right? And when he first came up with this idea, people said, that's nice, but how will we ever know how many different sources of market risk there are and what the betas against each one are? He said, not a problem. Give me a really powerful computer and 60 years of stock prices. And they did. In fact, he had to run his program overnight because it requires so much computer power. And he sent the computer on a search mission. It's a mainframe computer. You know what he was asking you to look for? How do I define market risk? It affects most or all companies at the same time, right? So he said, go through 60 years of data looking for patterns, looking for things that affect most or all companies 10, 15, 20, 30 times over. It's called a factor analysis. It's a statistical tool. And what a factor analysis yields is two pieces of output. First, it tells you how many factors the computer found in the data. The first time he ran it, the computer came back with five factors. He said, there are five factors that seem to be affecting these 60 years of stocks. But here's the bonus it gives you. It gives you the beta for each company against each of those five factors. This is golden. We now have a model that tells us how many ma measures of market risk there are and a beta against each one. That's called an arbitrage pricing model. And when it came out in 1978 and 79, people thought this was a godsend. This was going to replace the CAPM, but it never quite caught on. And to see why, 
I'll put myself back in 79. I'll make myself a banker at Solomon. Now they had a banking department then. And you're going to be my client. You'll be Pepsi. So I show up in your office. I'm your investment banker. And I say, look, we have this new model to come up with a hurdle rate for you. You've always used the CAPM. You had a 15% hurdle rate. I said, we've used this arbitrage pricing model. People like acronyms because it kind of intimidates. The APM, you have no idea what I'm talking about. I've lost the C. And say, so based on the arbitrage pricing model, your hurdle rate is 21%. And of course, you're curious as to why it went from 15 to 21%. So what, what happened? And I tell you why. I say, you're very sensitive to the second factor. What's your follow-up question going to be? What the heck is the second factor? I don't know what it is, but be very careful when it's around. You see what happened? What did, the, what did I run? A factor analysis, right? It's a statistical tool. So you know what it yields as output? It tells me there are five factors. You know what it calls them? Factor one, factor two, factor three. It's, a it's not an economic model. There is no way you're using 21% if I don't tell you what the second factor is. So you throw me out. For long, I walk back to my office. It's 150 miles. There's nothing else to do. And as I'm walking back, I'm thinking about why my sales pitch failed. Why did it fail? When you asked me what the second factor was, I couldn't give you a name, right? If only I could attach a name to each factor. Think of how much easier my sales pitch would be. And we also know those names have to be macroeconomic names, like interest rate and term structure and GDP growth. Now, it'd be unethical for me to name them randomly, though that's never stopped me before. <laughs> so, I hire, But I hire PhDs from math, and that's what Solomon did. It hired PhDs and math and statistics. He didn't need an econ PhD, and asked them to put names on those five factors. You say, how the heck did they do that? One of the nice pieces of output you get from a factor analysis, not only does it tell you what the uh, that there are five factors, it gives you a graph of each factor over time. So you know what, what these PhDs did, right? They did graphs of interest rates and term structure, and they tried to put, it's like two, putting two overheads on top of each other in the old days. So oh, that looks pretty close. But they're PhDs, so they have to do lots of mathematical stuff to kind of back this up. Two years later, and several million dollars poorer, you had names for the factors. Now you've named the factors. When you name those arbitrage pricing model, the nameless factors, you've gone from the arbitrage pricing model to what's generically called a multi-factor model. So by 1984 or 85, you now had names in the factors. I'm back at Solomon, so you've given me the MFM, multi-factor model. I show up at your office again, Pepsi, and say, we've got a new model. It's a multi-factor model. Based on it, your hurdle rate is 19%, lower than the 21% I got before, but still higher than what you're using. So you ask me, why? And I tell you, it's because you're really sensitive to the second factor. And this time, I'm ready for your follow-up question. In fact, if you don't ask me, I'll ask myself, what's the second factor? And I tell you, it's oil prices. And you say, what? We don't use any oil in Pepsi. It might taste like we do, but we have nothing to do with oil prices. <laughs> But you can see what happened, right? How did the math and statistics PhDs fit the factors? They looked at the past. People don't remember the 1970s were a period where oil prices were a big factor driving stock. They did their job. They fit the factors, but they fit them backwards. The only problem is by the time you got to 84, oil prices were no longer a factor. So multi-factor models, are, you can fit them. Great looking models for the past, but they're not very good at predicting the future. So the arbitrage pricing model comes out, not working. Multi-factor model, not working. 1991, Farm, Gene Farmer and Ken Prince, the two professors I talked about who did that correlation between Bay. They said, why are we even trying to come up with a model to measure risk? All we need is a hurdle rate, right? Why don't we let the market tell us what's risky and what's not? You think, what are you talking about? They went back and looked at data from 1962 through 91, about 30 years of data. And they looked at what kinds of companies earned high returns and what kinds of companies earned low returns in the market. They found that small market cap companies earned much higher returns than large market cap companies. You think, so what? They made a leap of faith. They said if small market cap companies earn high returns, it must be because they're risky. Right? Why, why would you do that? It's a rational market. So they said, if you're a small company, you must be risky. I call these karmic models for risk. Karmic because you're predestined to be risky. You can't do much about it. You're a small company. You're risky. You can show me your cash flows, your earnings. You can have guaranteed contracts. No, I don't care. You're small. You're risky. 
They also found that companies that traded low price to book ratios, the market value was much less than the book value, the accounting value for equity, had much higher returns than companies that traded at high price to book ratios. Again, they made that leap. If you're a company with a low price to book ratio, you must be riskier. And if you're a small company with a low price to book ratio, your hurdle rate must be through the roof. These are proxy models for risk. Do you see why I call them proxy? I'm letting some things, I've given up on measuring risk. I'm saying, I'm looking at your market cap, I'm looking at your price to book, those are going to be, become my proxies. And one of the things that's happened over the last 20 years is because data has become easily accessible and there's more data, people keep digging and digging and digging and every two years they come up with another proxy that works. But all of these proxies work where? In that time period you're looking at. And the problem with these proxy models again is they're pure fits and it's not clear that they're going to be good models going forward in terms of coming up with an expected return. So which brings me back to why I still stick with the capital. I know there are all these other models, more modern models, supposedly better models, at least looking backwards. I still use the CAPM, and to explain why I use the CAPM, I'm going to give you an anecdote. Use this anecdote when you're ever asked, how come you're using betas? Because by the time you finish with the anecdote, people might forget the question, and you can keep moving. So why are you still using betas? I tell them about this, this story about these two guys going camping. Late in the night, they're sitting around a campfire. It's a mellow time. You hear the sound of a crazed grizzly coming at them through the forest killing everything in its path. They can hear other campers screaming, other animals squealing. So one of the campers gets into a sleeping bag, zips up and gets ready to die. I don't know what form this takes, but I'm sorry for those bad deals I did. I'll never do another bad m and deal again. No. The other guy starts jogging in place, warming up. The guy in the sleeping bag says, what are you doing? He says, I'm, I'm going to run. The guy in the sleeping bag says, don't be crazy. You can't outrun a grizzly. They're at 50, 60 miles an hour and they're crazed. The guy who's warming up says, look, I don't have to outrun the grizzly. All I have to do is outrun you. <laughs> it's kind of a morbid, so think through the consequences. But that's exactly why, he's saying, what's this got to do with the CAPM? The CAPM, arbitrage pricing model, multi-factor models, they're all like campers. The grizzly is coming at them through the forest. At least the CAPM is out of the sleeping bag, ready to run. The rest are all zipped up with their five betas and five factor models. They're never going to get out. Let me ask you a question. If I gave you two crappy models to use and one requires only one number to estimate and the other requires five numbers to estimate, which crappy model are you going to go with? Go with the one factor. This is not a permanent choice. If five years from now, ten years from now, you can come up with a risk and return model that works much better than the CAPM, I will draw the, drop the cap M in a second. I'm not wedded to betas. I don't lie awake and say, please, let betas survive. I need a hurdle rate. If you can give me a better way of estimating hurdle rates, I'm there in a second. Don't mistake tools for philosophies. There are people who abandon all of corporate finance because they don't like beta. That's like saying, I'm not going to be a Catholic because mass lasts too long. I mean, it's, it's completely in... No, disproportionate because you're giving up something because you don't like a part of the process. You don't like betas, find a different way of measuring risk. We're on the same page, we can move on. So that's basically the, the process of coming up with the risk. So here's what I'd like you to do on your company. Take a look at, so look at that holding page that you had for the HDS page, you printed it off. Incidentally, I know you don't open the, the, the links that I sent, but I have a link that I sent, I think, on your Sunday email. I did skip Monday. That was very nice of me. It was torturous. I had to wait till 12. So that's why the next day the email came out first thing in the morning because there's like pent-up demand to send out an email. Right? But take a look at the Sunday email. I actually sent a link to a guide that I put together to read your Bloomberg packet, right? So if you're, if you're, if you're well versed in Bloomberg, you might not need it, but this is a guide I put together simply because I was confused when I first looked at Bloomberg and where to look at things. So print it off and keep it. You might not use it right now, but at least get, have it to draw. Also look at the breakdown of investment and make a judgment, just like I did for, for, for my companies, as whether you're okay with this assumption that the margin investor is an institution. If you're not, don't freak out. We'll talk about what to do next, but it's good to be aware of it before you jump into that part of the process. 
So that's all the, ris the theory you're going to hear on risk and return, and that wasn't even theory. This is the intuition behind the models. Now we're going to get pragmatic. I want to hurt a rate stuff. Okay? I'm going to stick with the cap M because I've told you why. And to use the cap M, I need three numbers. I need a risk free rate. I need a beta. And I need an equity risk premium. So today I want to start with the easiest of those three numbers. Which should be the easiest of those three numbers to get? The risk free rate. In fact, when I did my MBA, I think we spent one minute on the risk free rate. I was told the risk free rate is a UST bond rate. Let's move on. Shows you how dollar centric MBA programs were. And how the presumption was if it's the US Treasury, it must be risk free. So let me lay the foundations for what we need to come up with the risk free rate. Remember that one year table that I described as risk free? It was risk free because your expected return was always delivered to you. That's what you need for something to be risk free. So here are the requirements for something to be used as a risk free rate. The first is the entity issuing the security can have no default risk, not even an iota. You say, what if it's a little bit? It's like being a little bit pregnant. It doesn't work. It's zero one. You're either pregnant or you're not. You're either risk free or you're not. If there is default risk, it cannot be risk free. And already you can see the beginnings of a problem, right? Because if I ask you what the risk free rate is in, I could make it really different, with Russian rubles, Argentine pesos, you say, oh my God, I can't even get there. Because there is no default free entity. We'll talk about what to do with those currencies, but there can be no default risk. Second, there can be no reinvestment risk. Let me explain. Let's say you have a five year cash flow. You want a five year risk free rate, right? Would a six month T bill work as my risk free rate if I have a five year cash flow? What's the problem with using a six month T bill? Even if you assume the US Treasury is default free, there's at the end of six months I have to reinvest at what rate? I don't know yet. Rates could change. A six month T bill is not risk free if I have a five year cash flow. Would a five year T bond be risk free if I have a five year cash flow? I'm getting closer, but there's one small problem. Every six months, what do I get on a five year T bond? I get coupons, which I have to get reinvested. Can I just take the coupons out of the T-bond? In fact, if I strip those coupons out of a T-bond, and people have been allowed to do that now for about 20 years, you know what I end up with? If I take all the coupons out, what's left in the bond? Just the principal, the face value. That's called a zero coupon bond. A five year, so if I were a purist, here's what I'd need to do. You have a five year cash flow, I'd have to find a five year T-bond, assuming the treasury is default free, and that would be a risk free rate. I've created a nightmare for you because here's what's going to happen then. If you have one year cash flows, two year cash flows, three year, four year, five, which is your, what you're going to have. You, in theory, if you wanted to a risk free rate, would have to match up a zero coupon bond rate with each cash flow. You might be okay with that torture, but I'm not. So I'm going to give you a way out of this because this is a pain in the neck to do. I don't know whether you've ever heard of duration matching. In the old days when banks were banks, and just did banking. Duration matching was one way they managed risk. And in duration matching, the way banks managed interest rate risk is they took the average duration of their assets and tried to set the average duration of their liabilities equal to it. It's not perfect because in the perfect world, you'd have to match up each asset with a liability of equal. They said, that's a pain, it's too much. So if your assets have an average duration of eight years, if you set your liabilities to an average duration of eight years, roughly speaking, you had no interest rate risk. Very simple concept. I'm going to, let, I'm going to borrow on that con concept. Let's say you're going to do a capital budgeting project. It's a 10-year project. You have cash flows in year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, all the way through year 10. Let's say it's back-ended. The bigger cash flows are later on. And let's say the weighted average of when you get your cash flows, the duration of your cash flows across the 10 years is seven and a half years. You see what I mean by duration? It's a weighted average of when your cash flows come in. And because the bigger cash flows happen at the end, the average is tilted towards the 10. So it's seven and a half. Here's what I think you can get away doing. If you can find one government bond with a duration of roughly seven and a half years and use it as your risk free rate all the way through, instead of using each year as the different risk free rate, I think you're close enough to being risk free. In fact, I'll make your life even easier. In corporate finance, we almost never deal with six month or one year cash flows. Everything is long term. Everything is rolled over. If you use a 10 year default free bond rate as your risk free rate, I think you're going to be okay 
as a risk free rate. So all I need to get a risk free rate is find a 10 year default free bond and I'm home. So let's start simply. Let's start with the US. I ask you what's the risk free rate in US dollars? First remember risk free rates don't go with countries, they go with currencies. And to kind of draw the distinction, if you ask me what's the risk free rate for Greece, that's a dumb question. Because Greece doesn't have a currency. Fifteen years ago, if you asked me what's the risk-free rate in Greece, I would have given you the rate in Greek drachmas. But today, if you ask me what's the risk-free rate for Greece, I say, no, there is no risk-free rate for Greece. I can give you a risk-free rate in euros. So the first thing to remember is risk-free rates don't go with countries, they go with currencies. So let's start easy. Let's start with the risk-free rate in US dollars. For the moment, let's make the assumption that the US Treasury is default free. And it's an assumption because remember three years ago we had that debate about is the US Treasury truly default free. So it's, it's, a, it's more a belief, you, you, it's not a proof, it's a belief that it's, so if it's default free, all you need to do is give me a 10 year US Treasury bond rate today and I'd have a risk free rate, right? So what did, wh what's that number look like today? What's a 10 year USD bond rate? It's about 2 point something, 2.05, 2.06%. So if I were doing my analysis today in US dollars, which is what you guys are doing, because I hope you picked a company and if it's in US dollars, this is your moment of you know, get the risk free rate nailed down. It'd be 2.06%, but here's the bad news. Your project is not due till when? I'll remind you. The last class, which is May 11th of 2015. Do you think the T-bond rates might change between now and then? So I'll make a suggestion to you because if you hard code the risk free rate, it is going to be dated by this evening. So what I would suggest is you keep a master input page in Excel where you enter the T bond rate. You don't have to update it every minute of every day. I'm not, a, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not that sadistic. But keep numbers which are macro numbers that you know are going to change in that page. That way if you change it, all the other pages can be linked up to you're not changing six spreadsheets at the same time. But your risk free rate, if you're doing things in US dollars, would be a US T bond rate. In fact, I was doing this in November of 2013, and remember for Disney, with, where my analysis was in US dollars, not because it's a US company, because I did my, my analysis in US dollars, the risk free rate I used was the 10 year T bond rate then. So if you see 2.75% as my number, don't use it today. That was the risk free rate in November of 2013 when I did my numbers for Disney. So that's my risk free rate in US dollars. Let's move one step up the ladder. I have at least one company in my sample where I need Deutsche Bank, where I need a euro risk free rate. So what did I do to get a US dollar risk free rate? I found a 10 year government bond in that currency and I looked up the rate, right? So that's what I did for the euro. I went and found a 10 year government bond denominated in euros. And I got a luxury of riches. I didn't find one bond. I found one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I don't know why, you know. Actually, here it is. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 11 bonds. Let me ask you a question. Let me make your life really difficult. Let's suppose you're assessing a Spanish company in euros. You want a risk-free rate in euros. Which of these numbers will you use as your risk-free rate if you're working in euros for a Spanish company? Let me first give you a choice. Would you use the Spanish 10-year bond rate? What's the problem with it? It's in euros, but what's... That includes uh, country risk. And, and how do we know that? No. But 15 years ago, this would have been more difficult to say because then what did I have shown you? I'd have shown you a peseta bond and a euro bond. But here it's actually staring at you. You, know, I don't even, you don't even have to prove to there's default risk because if it's 10-year bonds and they're all in euros, the only reason you have higher rates for some countries and lower for others is because the market perceives fairly or unfairly more default risk in some countries. So the Spanish 10-year bond will not work because it's not default free. But if I force you to pick a bond then which would you pick as your risk free rate? And don't get too caught up in the German part of it. I'm picking the German bond because it's the lowest rate. 10 years from now if it was a Portuguese bond, miracles can happen. <laughs> How do you use that? It's the lowest of the rates. In fact, you could even go further and say none of these countries are default free because the only bank that can actually issue the currency is the European Central Bank. ECB has 10 year bonds which are like two basis points below the German bond. You know what that rate looks like today? What's a German 10 year bond rate? 
it's not quite there, but it's, you know, the, the Swiss and the Danish rates have gone negative. The, the German euro bond rate is about 0.4%, the 10-year bond rate. The, the shorter term, term rates might have gone negative, but the 10-year bond rate is about, so if you're doing your analysis in euros today, your risk-free rate is 0.4%. But you're saying, but I, it's a Spanish company. I know you want to punish this company for being a Spanish company. The risk-free rate is not the place to do it. I'll give you plenty of chances to take a whack at the company later on. Don't make the risk-free rate your instrument of torture. So we have a risk-free rate here. And for me, when I did my analysis, the risk-free rate I used for Deutsche was 1.75%. In November of 2013, that was the risk-free rate. So I extrapolated from this. For the euro and the US dollar, I was able to find a AAA rated entity. And I'm trusting the ratings agencies to actually know what they're doing because they say AAA means you're default free. And I used the 10-year bond rate and the German bond. I look for any country where I, any AAA rated. So I look for all currencies where there was a AAA rated country issuing the currency. And I got risk-free rates in yen, franc, euros. For, so these are all countries which are AAA rated. I found the 10-year bond rate. So those are my risk-free rates in those currencies. So these are, I think of these as the easy currencies, because all you have to do is find a government bond, which is AAA rated, issuing those currencies, and you're home free. I'll come back and talk about why the rates are different in different currencies, but these are the easy cases. You know what the difficult cases are? Is if I'm in a Indonesian rupiah, or Indian rupees, or Argentine peso, there is no, there is no AAA entity issuing bonds in that currency. Then you say, what do I do? So I'll give you a framework for what to do if you're working with a currency where there's no AAA rated entity. In fact, I had to do it for a couple of my companies. Let me start with Tata Motors, where I needed a risk-free rate in Indian rupees. So I started the way I did all my other currency searches. I went and found an Indian government bond denominated in rupees. It has to be denominated in that currency. You can't find you can't take a Brazilian bond denominated in dollars and make it your nominal real risk free rate. So I found, so I found a 10-year bond denominated in rupees. It was 8.82%. I got down and I said, thank you, God, I've got a rate. But before I use that as my risk free rate, what do I have to, to figure out is whether any of that is for default risk, right? Because there's default risk in there. It's not default free. So I opened up the Moody's website. And I encourage you to try the same. Clicked on the sovereign ratings which are the ratings that the ratings agency attaches to countries. And here's what you're going to see. see you're, you're going to see a page with 140 countries. You know, very helpfully alphabetically sorted. So if you know where your country falls in the alphabet, you should have an easy time finding it. I went down, I found India, I went across, and I found two ratings for India. A local currency rating and a foreign currency rating. Let's do the easy part first. What's the foreign currency rating measuring? It's when India, they both measure default risk, but they measure default risk if India borrows in US dollars or euros or some currency that's not rupees. Then I looked at the local currency rating. And what I was hoping and praying, I would, what would make my life easy? What rate? If I found a AAA rating there, you know what I'd have done? I'd have used the 8.82% as my risk free rate and bl blame Moody's if something went wrong. But I didn't get that lucky. What I found on Moody's was a local currency rating of BAA3 for India. So if I trust Moody's, which is a dangerous thing to do, they're telling me there's default risk in the local currency bond and so the risk is measured with the BAA3 rating. I actually have a lookup table on my website. In fact, the webcast for this week is about risk free rates. If you get a chance, watch it. It's about how to come up with the spread. The default spread I came up with for a BAA3 rated country was 2.25%. Let's do an algebra problem. The Indian government bond rate is 8.82%. To the extent that I trust Moody's, 2.25% of that is for default risk. I want a risk-free rate. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to net out the 2.25% from the 8.82%. My Indian rupee risk-free rate is now going to be 6.57%. That's what you're going to see as your risk-free rate for Indian rupees in November of 2013. If you had to do this today, First, you'd have to find the Indian government bond rate today. So I'll, I'll give you the link to find these local currency government bond rates. You'll have to find the rating for your country. I'll give you the link to do that. You'll have to convert that rating into a default spread. I'll give you the link to do that. And you should be able to come up with a risk-free rate in most currencies. And I did the same thing for Chinese renminbi in November of 2013. 
The government bond rate was 4.3%. China has a higher rating, but it's not AAA yet. It's AA3. I subtract out the default spread based on the rating. The risk-free rate in Chinese renminbi is 3.5%. And I got to Vale. It's a Brazilian company, right? I should be doing everything in nominal rias. There is no should be. Currency is a choice. I can choose to do my assessment whatever currency I do. That's actually a huge free. You know, so if you're doing a Russian company, you don't have to do it in rubles. That's a huge relief for you. I decided to do my entire analysis of Vale in US dollars. And here's my defense. It's a commodity company. You think, so what? Oil companies and commodity companies, if you look at their financials, actually report first in US dollars because that's the market they sell into and then they convert into local currency. It's a local currency financial statement that's actually the concocted one. So I'm going to stay with dollars and here's the nice thing about doing Vale in US dollars. What was the risk-free rate in US dollars for Disney? 2.75%. You know what the risk-free rate in US dollars for Vale is? It's 2.75%. If you, if you pick a, so if you decide to do a Russian company in euros, your risk-free rate is going to be the German euro bond rate. As I said, don't worry about punishing Russia for risk. You, I'll, I'll give you a way to do it, but the risk-free rate is not the place to do it. Okay? So if you have a local currency government bond, get the risk-free rate then. If, you, if that gets to be difficult, either because a currency is tough to work with or you can't find a government bond, shift to a different currency. If that doesn't work for you, you can do everything in real terms. You know what real terms is? You take inflation out of your cash flows and you come up with a real risk free rate. So where the heck am I going to get that? Open up the Wall Street Journal, look at the Treasury section. There's a rate there that you can use as your real risk free rate. What am I talking about? So what are the TIPS rate? T TIPS is a US Treasury. It's an inflation index Treasury bond. Right now, the rate is about 0.8%. That's your real risk free rate. Make that choice because that effectively will determine what to do next. Now the key number to, to do all of these is that default spread, right? And there are three ways you can get the default spread. If you can find a dollar denominated bond issued by this country. For instance, Brazil has dollar denominated bonds. And in November of 2013, that bond had a rate of 4.25%. You can subtract out the T bond rate from that and get a default spread from that. That's the first choice. In fact, that used to be the only choice until about a decade ago. Then the CDS market opened up. You know what the CDS market is? It's an insurance market against default risk. And the nice thing about the CDS market is there are 66 countries where that spread gets updated every minute of every day. In November of 2013, that CDS spread for Brazil was 2.5%. That was how much you'd have had to pay each year's insurance. That's a default risk for Brazil on the CDS market. Or if you don't have the first two numbers, you can't find a dollar denominated bond, you can't find a CDS spread, here's the third way you can get it. You give me the rating for Brazil, I can look up the default spread that goes with that rating. So if you get a chance, watch that webcast because that's what I go through. And this is my last page for today. Start of this year, I came up with risk-free rates you know, for every currency. So this was the November 2013 edition of my risk-free rates. From everything from Taiwanese dollars to Brazilian rias. You pick the currency, you get a different risk-free rate, right? So my last question for today is, why do risk-free rates vary across currencies? I'm talking about risk-free rates, not government bond rates. We can talk about default risk. Risk-free rates, let's suppose I've cleaned up for default risk. Why do risk-free rates vary across currencies? You want to try? What's the reason why risk-free rates vary across currencies? No? See, then you're talking about risk. Then, I'm, then I made a mistake on the risk-free rate. If, there is, if these are truly risk-free, volatility can't be the answer. That should be in the spread. I should have removed it. That's, you can have Saudi Arabia, solely dependent on oil. You can have countries that are solely dependent on currency where you don't have any default risk. Right? Well, uh, that's a cash, cash flow effect. Yeah. Inflation. Inflation. If you want to crack the code on currencies, that's it. Once you've cleaned up your currencies, there's only one reason why risk-free rates vary across currencies. Higher inflation currencies will have higher risk-free rates. Lower inflation rate currencies will have lower risk-free rates. File that away because that's why it doesn't matter what currency you do the analysis in because what one hand gives you, the other hand will take away. So if you pick a low inflation currency, you get a low cost of capital, a low hurdle rate, right? But if you pick a low inflation currency, when you do your cash flows and returns, guess what? 
you'll also get lower cash flows and lower returns. If you do things right, and I'll try to back this up, it shouldn't matter which currency you do your analysis in as long as you are consistent about the way you do it. That's it. Many countries you might have only the CDS spread. Yeah. Right. Like Brazil, you have all three. Right. Right. You can pick anyone as long as you stay consistent with that all the way through. Because what will help you on one will hurt you on the other. So if you decide to go with, let's say, the government bond spread, which is lower, your risk free rate will be higher. Right. Yeah. But it will also mean the equity risk premium for Brazil. Because so as long as you stay with that same spread right. all the way through your assessment, it will all even. And I know you're looking at data. I'm just going to look at Indian Hotels Group, which is part of it. That's fine. Thank you. 